This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. Good evening, everybody. Thanks for coming. Um, my name's Terry Friedlander. Uh, I'm a medical oncologist. I work here at UCSF in the Cancer Center. Uh, and as part of the mini medical school, uh, I'm going to be talking this week about bladder cancer. And I'm going to be talking next week about uh, testicular cancer. I know some of you were here last week to hear Dr. Ryan talk about prostate cancer. So we're sort of covering all the bases. Um, I specialized in general urinary cancer partly because they, uh, cancers that happen in the genital urinary tract, which are really kidney cancers, bladder cancers, prostate cancer, and testis cancer, those are the majority, are all really very different from each other. They all are caused by different um, sort of stresses on the body, and they uh, act, they behave in different ways, and they respond to very different therapies. And so I think what you'll find over the course of these few weeks is that there's really a lot of variety, a lot of heter difference between these different kinds of cancer. Um, we're making strides, I think, in all of them in, in terms of curing them or treating people who have advanced disease. Um, and so I'm going to talk, I'm going to focus on bladder today. So I'm going to talk a little bit about bladder cancer, about really the, um, first the epidemiology. So this is a picture of the different types of tissue in our body. And basically, our skin looks like this. If you were to cut a little section of the skin, you would see that there are these layers of different cells um, in the skin. The, some of these other types of tissue line different organs. So for example, this is what the uh, intestine is lined by. Um, and it's called columnar uh, epithelium. The bladder is lined by something called transitional epithelium, meaning if you, if you took a little section of the bladder, the wall of the bladder, it would sort of look like this. And that's very important because the cancers that arise in the bladder are cancers of these types of cells, and they behave differently than cancers of any of the other types of cells. So very frequently, I will refer to bladder cancer as transitional cell cancer or transitional cell carcinoma. They mean the same thing, but um, this is sort of a picture of, of what what it looks like, at least what the normal tissue looks like. And I'll show you what the cancer looks like in just a few slides. Um, so bladder cancer is a very common cancer. It's the fifth most common cancer in people. Um, there's a preponderance of men over women. It causes almost 15,000 deaths a year. This is just in the United States. So after lung, prostate, breast, and colon cancer, it's the next most common cause of cancer. And I think that's very under-recognized uh, nationally about what a problem bladder cancer really is. Um, this is sort of gets back to what I was just saying about these different types of tissue. The vast majority in the West, in sort of Western Europe and, and the U.S., is, is, comes from the lining of the bladder, um, and that's called transitional cell carcinoma. Sometimes we also call it urothelial. So you'll notice we have a lot of different terms for some, for the, to describe the same thing. Um, there are some cases of bladder cancer that are not this type of tissue, where there's other types of tissue in the bladder, and they can cause other kinds of cancers. I'm not really going to talk about those much because they're very rare. But what I'm really going to focus on is, is the, the major problem up here. Um, bladder cancer is more common in men. There's almost a two to one predominance of men getting bladder cancer compared to women. And it's also more common in people over the age of 50. And that probably has to do, in a large part, with the fact that um, over time, our bodies, uh, 
our more environmental problems can happen in our body, meaning if you smoke over 50 years, you, your body will accumulate all the damage of 50 years of cigarette smoke. And I'll explain that a little better in just a second. So tobacco is by far the biggest risk factor for developing bladder cancer. People who smoke tobacco are up to five times more likely to develop bladder cancer. And I think almost everybody knows about the link between lung cancer and smoking, but very few know about the link between bladder cancer and smoking. Um, but it's just about as strong as the link for lung cancer. And I'll explain why in a second. There are some other risk factors that lead to bladder cancer. Um, this is a very uncommon risk, but in Germany in the last century or in the 1900s when the first dyes were developed for clothing, they were all full of this co uh, compound called aniline or aniline dyes. And these are very toxic to the bladder. So, so the workers who were working with this would inhale the fumes of it or get the liquid on their hands and somehow get it into their body. And it would essentially filter down into their bladder and sit there and really cause bladder tumors. Um, people who get chronic infections or chronic inflammation of the bladder are at more risk for getting bladder cancer as well. So this is an x-ray or a radiograph where these are the hips, this is the spine, and what you notice here is a little stone that's sitting high up in the kidney. And sometimes these stones can form and get lodged there, and they obviously can cause a lot of trouble for anybody who's ever had a kidney stone. But that chronic inflammation can cause a lot of damage to the cells there and lead to cancer developing um, over time. Uh, very rarely, this is the most common cause of cancer in the Arab or the Middle East, specifically in Egypt, is a worm that is present in the drinking water and sort of polluted drinking water. And the worm gets into the body and lands in the bladder and will live in the bladder. These are microscopic. You can't even see them with your eye. But they're really small, and they cause a lot of inflammation in the bladder, and, and um, people will develop bladder cancer because of that. Um, and then also, very rarely, other chemotherapies that are given for other reasons can predispose people to getting bladder cancer. And specifically, this drug called cytoxan or cyclophosphamide, it's been around for a very long time, it also gets filtered by the body and lands in the urine, and it sits in the bladder, and over time can cause damage to the bladder itself. Um, but again, these last two are very rare causes of bladder cancer. By far, tobacco is the most common cause of bladder cancer. If we outlawed cigarette smoking today, if nobody smoked another cigarette for the next 50 years, the rates of bladder cancer would probably go down by 60 or 70 percent. That's how powerful tobacco is in causing bladder cancer nationwide. Questions? Is the Schistosomiasis. Rarity because you're only looking at United States patients? Yeah, so is the schistosomiasis rare because we're only looking in the U.S.? Really, the schistosomiasis only lives in places like Egypt and in places in the Middle East. So it's just, high incidence of bladder cancer? Yeah, and so they have much higher incidence, and it causes a very specific type of bladder cancer. And so that's much more common. So there are Egyptian hospitals which have these case series of like, a thousand patients with bladder cancer, which is very big series, and that's just because it's so it's so much more common there. Okay. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the biology of bladder cancer, and I've been sort of alluding to this already. So this is a picture of the bladder. The bladder is basically a reservoir, right? It just its function is to hold urine for, in the body, and it's supposed to do that for our whole life. Um, this is where the kidneys, in this diagram, the kidneys would be sort of up here, the uh, urine would filter down into the bladder here, and then it would come out through the urethra um, in, in, um, you know, at the time that we go to the bathroom. Um, this is the sort of the cutaway, so this is the inside of the bladder. So you can imagine that anything in the urine is essentially bathing the wall of the bladder in, in whatever sort of um, toxic substances are in the urine. And obviously urine is a waste product. Our bodies are trying to get rid of it. So if uh, someone smokes cigarettes, that cigarette smoke is, goes into their lungs, into their bloodstream, and eventually gets filtered out by the kidneys. And so those same toxins that were present in the cigarette get filtered by the kidneys into the urine. And then for someone who smokes a pack a day, they essentially have a continuous bathing of the wall of their bladder in carcinogens, in, in sort of chemicals that cause cancer. 
And so it's even worse than the lungs because when you think about smoking a cigarette, most people will smoke and then stop and then they'll have some time to clean out their lungs. In fact, for bladder cancer, the, ba the bladder is just continually bathed in these chemicals. Um, and so all those uh, risk factors I just talked about increase the risk of getting bladder cancer because the whole field of the bladder is exposed to, to these toxins. Questions about that? There's a term we use for this, and we call it field cancerization effect. And what that means is the field, which is the entire lining of the bladder, is all exposed to the same carcinogens, the same toxins. And so when we see cancer in one part of the bladder, very commonly it's present in multiple parts of the bladder. Because whatever damage was sufficient to cause bladder in one place here has caused bladder cancer at another spot in the bladder. It's very rare to just find it in one spot remove it and, and cure somebody of bladder cancer. Does that make sense? Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about how we stage bladder cancer. So when I see someone in the clinic who's newly diagnosed, you know, how do I think about this? And this is essentially a cutaway of the bladder again, where here is the inside lining of the bladder. Most bladder tumors that start off, if you were to look at them, you know, by putting a camera into the bladder, a little scope, you would see these little sort of frilly, almost frond-looking um, growths. And this is very typical for bladder cancer. Um, we don't necessarily, it's, or I shouldn't say we don't care, but it's not as important how high or how tall these fronds are. What's actually much more important is the base of the frond. How deep does that thing penetrate? Which actually counts for much more. And so what you're seeing up top here is essentially a schematic of the base of these um, tumors. And what I'm gonna talk about a little bit is what really matters clinically is whether the tumor itself is just right here at the very topmost part of the wall of the bladder or whether it penetrates deep inside, like for example, into the muscle of the bladder or in some cases all the way through the bladder and sort of comes out on the other side. Those you can imagine are obviously much more worse or much worse tumors. Um, so the way I think about this is there are really three broad categories of bladder cancer. There's superficial, which means that it's just confined to this very innermost layer of the bladder, and that's the majority of bladder cancers. There's about another percentage that just invade into the muscle, the muscular wall of the bladder, so deeper here, and I'll show that on another slide. And then there's a small percent of patients who, when they first show up in the clinic, or first present to medical attention, the cancer is not only sort of spread into the muscle of the bladder, but it's actually already left the bladder gone into the bloodstream, and traveled somewhere else in the body. And we call that metastatic cancer. And that means that it's essentially outside of the pelvis. It's outside of the bladder. Does that make sense? The reason why most of the cancers are superficial is because these, these fronds are sort of inherently very unstable, and they'll bleed. And so over time, as these, as these tumors grow, little blood vessels will break, they'll bleed, and a patient will notice that there's blood in the urine and they'll come in to see a urologist, you know, and they'll get essentially a, a workup and they'll sort of find the early tumors. So in that sense, actually bladder cancer is a little, there's a little more hope there because it's something that is actually pretty, it's detectable much earlier than say other cancers where you wouldn't know that they're growing unless you had a CT scan or some other way of looking in the body. Does that make sense? Um, so the goals of therapy are sort of different for each of these types, each of these stages of bladder cancer. So when bladder cancer is just superficial, when it's just confined to the innermost lining of the bladder, it's a very curable disease. And so the goal is obviously to get rid of the tumor, but also to prevent it from coming back. And I'll say a little bit about that. When the cancer goes into the muscle, the muscular wall of the bladder, it doesn't matter how much of this bladder wall you scrape away or a urologist scrapes away, because if the cancer cells really deep into the muscle, you can never scrape away all of the muscle of the bladder. You'd just be left with a big hole. And so in that case, we have to do more drastic measures. And I'll talk about that in just a little bit. But what we really want to do is when someone comes in with a muscle invasive bladder cancer is really try and maximize their chance of being cured of this disease. And there's ways to do that with chemotherapy, with radiation therapy, with surgery. I'm going to talk about all of those. When bladder cancer is metastatic, we currently don't have the tools to cure people of metastatic disease. There's some very exciting new studies coming out that 
we're hoping really advance the field and really make that cure a possibility and, and sort of the jury's still out on that. But when I see someone who comes in with metastatic disease, the goals are really to prolong life and make symptoms better. Question? So that, are you saying that the superficial type, if, does it progress to the muscle invasive? Yeah, so does the super, so yeah, so do these progress? Yeah, so this is the natural history, exactly, of bladder cancer. So they always start as these superficial tumors. So that these people haven't had the bleeding that would bring them Correct. sooner. Correct. And is there any, like, you're, well, I guess, I was thinking of uh, micro, uh, you know, uh, blood in the urine. That people, you know, don't notice that. But is there any, you know, is there a goal of having people who smoke screen for bladder cancer? Yeah, so the question is, is there a goal of sort of doing screening for bladder cancer, especially in people who are high risk, like smokers? There is, there's actually a number of tests that use sort of genetic assays. So it's not just peeing into a cup and looking to see if there's blood, or even looking to see if there's a cancer cell, but looking to see if there's sort of signatures of the cancer cell, genetic signatures. And so some of these tests have been developed and they're actually already available. So you can screen people. There's not been a study that I'm aware of of screening a, a large, you know, 10,000 or 50,000 people for bladder cancer. But that's actually a very good thought. The, so I, there's a number of different consortiums of uh, investigators who are looking into that, into how to best screen. How do you uh, determine whether it's superficial or muscular invasive? So how, yeah, how do you determine what it is or how deep it is? And that's a really good question because as I'll show you on the next slide, when a urologist is working up a patient, they'll put a camera into the bladder and look around, but obviously you can only see the inside of the bladder, you can't see the wall. And so that's where we'll use CT scans or sometimes MRI, and that can give us a better sense of what's going on in the bladder itself. Sometimes we don't know, sometimes we think, you know, if, um, it's hard to tell how deep it is. When the urologist does a biopsy, a biopsy, which is essentially where they scrape this away, we always wanna see that there's at least a little bit of muscular tissue there when they scrape it away. So we know that they've, he's gotten all the way down to the root, essentially, of this tumor and into the muscle. And if there's n muscle there, but there are no cancer cells in the muscle, that's usually sufficient to say that it's just superficial. But you're right, we can never really know unless we you know, remove the bladder and really look, look finely at it. Um, getting back to the um, smoking yeah. connection, would somebody with black also be prone to bladder? Yeah, so with, with somebody with black lung, which is essentially, I think you're referring to like coal? Yes. Yeah, so someone who's, someone who's had a prolonged exposure to coal, I, I think they would. I'm not, I'm not sure if there's data to, to say for sure, but any real exposure of carcinogens over time that goes into the lungs eventually finds its way down into the bladder. So it'd certainly be at risk. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the sort of pathology and the workup. So this is the urinary tract. I said this before, here are the kidneys. The kidneys filter the blood which comes through the arteries and veins here. And they make urine. The urine goes down these ureters, which are these yellow um, essentially tubes here, and down into the bladder, and then from the bladder it comes out through the urethra. So almost all of the bladder cancers that we see occur in the bladder except for about 5% of them, which can occur higher up in the ureters. And that's because the lining of the bladder actually extends all the way up these ureters, all the way up to where they meet the kidney. So it's the exact same tissue. And so whatever carcinogens have been exposed to the bladder also, you know, also are, um, can potentially damage the ureters as well. So rarely we'll see people who come in with a large tumor sort of up here, or they come in with obstruction of the ureter, and their kidney swells up and they get pain. Um, and a urologist can actually put a camera or sort of essentially a wire up here and take a biopsy and figure out if the cancer is high up in the urinary tract. These are a little harder to treat because very commonly, 
uh, you, the kidney has to be removed as well if the tumor's of any size near the kidney, and that just makes treating somebody much harder. There's some hereditary cancer syndromes, meaning people are born with an increased risk of developing a cancer. For example, Angelina Jolie has a hereditary cancer syndrome. She just had a mastectomy to reduce her risk of getting cancer. There's a syndrome called Lynch syndrome, which causes predominantly colon cancer, but it also can cause tumors up here in the urinary tract. Why it causes tumors here and not down here, nobody really knows. But uh, about once a year, we'll see somebody with, who's 42 years old, otherwise really healthy, and comes in with a large tumor up here. And then we have to think about, does he have a, or she have a cancer syndrome? Because it doesn't make sense for somebody that young to develop cancer, or this kind of cancer at least. Um, so I've already talked about this. These are the different histologies. I sort of mentioned this in the first slide. Okay. Any questions? So I want to talk a little bit, it's going to be very brief, but about the genetics and sort of the molecular biology of bladder cancer. And I show this slide because I think it's a very good one. There's a progression, and I think there's a question asked earlier about does bladder cancer go from superficial to muscle invasive to metastatic. There's a similar progression from normal tissue, this is sort of about how cancer forms, to bladder cancer. And so this is an example, a cross-section of normal tissue from the bladder. What we think happens is that there's genetic changes that I've already been talking about in individual cancer cells that gives them what's called a growth advantage, basically allows these cells to grow faster than their neighbors. And what happens is you get a condition called hyperplasia, which just means fast growth. And you can see there's more cells here. They're a little more active. They're sort of, they're sort of all turned on. And what happens is there's different, um, different very critical checkpoints and the cells become lost. And there's two sort of paths they can take. One is that they um, amplify a gene that's called FGFR3, and that allows for even more growth of the cells. And you can start to see they become a little more dysregulated. And then they start losing some very important sort of policemen of the cell or checkpoints in the cell that tell the cell to stop growing. And this one's, one's called RB1, one is called P53. And what happens is that just leads to even more dysregulation. And eventually what you get is what really looks like bladder cancer. Sometimes these uh, checkpoints are lost very early, so they can go straight from this hyperplastic or hyperplasia to what looks like frank cancer. And as there's sort of more and more um, genetic mutations occurring, the cancers tend to look more aggressive and sort of more dysregulated. And those are all, you know, obviously bad things. Um, questions about this? So the one, one other point I'll make is that it's, it's a multiple hit problem, meaning that it's one cell or maybe a group of cells that are taking sequential hits over time. So bladder cancer doesn't go straight from being a normal sort of normal looking can uh, bladder cell to being full on cancer. This is a process that takes time. Okay. Just this year, uh, this is the last slide I have on the genetics and molecular biology, but this is really important because just this year, a consortium called the Cancer Genome Atlas, which is a consortium of like just about every major academic center in the country, got together and said, we're going to take newly diagnosed cancers from 100, 200, 500 patients and sequence them all the same way using multiple different types of genetic testing. And what they found was in, for example, breast cancer, there's very clear distinction between breast cancers that are sensitive to hormone therapy and breast cancers that are not. And if you look at the genetic changes that occur in them, they can separate them out very easily. Bladder cancer was not so clear. What we see here is essentially each one of these columns in this grid is an individual tumor that they took. There are 130 columns here. And all of these are genes. And what they said was these are just the most common genes that were altered. And so, for example, this very first patient had a mutation in this gene, this gene, and this gene, and then one here, one here, one here. And what they did essentially is create an atlas or a catalog of all of the mutations that occur at a common frequency in bladder cancer. And what this shows you is how heterogeneous the disease is. That there's no, you know, any one tumor doesn't, you know, from one patient doesn't look like the tumor from the, from the patient, you know, next door. And this is probably because cigarette smoking is so bad for our bodies 
that it just causes so many genetic changes in the cells, so many different types of mutations, that everybody's tumor is essentially like an individual or unique. Does that make sense? What is it in the smoke? Is it the tar or the nicotine? It's, there's a lot of different chemicals. There's like a couple hundred different chemicals in cigarette smoke that all of them go in there and essentially damage DNA and cause errors in the DNA. So that's what that's what's damaging in the smoke. So are you saying that all of the patients in the study were also smokers? No, so actually it's interesting you asked were all the patients smokers? The patients who on this second bar who were red were smokers. So there were some patients here who weren't smokers, but maybe they had an exposure to secondhand smoke. Maybe they had an exposure to car exhaust. Maybe they were who knows what what caused their cancer. A lot of them as you can see were smokers. What we were hoping is that they would very clearly be different, meaning that the smokers would look one way and the non-smokers would look a very different way, and then we'd essentially have two different types of disease, and maybe we could start thinking about them differently, treating them differently. But the bladder is just such a, such a reservoir for, for toxins that when, when changes happen, they're just very scattered. Um, and so it's, you know, it, it makes us think that, it makes me think, I should say, that there's probably not one gene that's responsible for bladder cancer. Like there's some that are very commonly mutated. This one, P53, which I actually mentioned on the last slide, you can see is, is mutated in about half of the cancers, right, this first row. But it's not the only thing that's wrong in these cells. And so it makes the idea that we're gonna have one pill that's gonna have, you know, that's gonna target one gene and fix bladder cancer, I think that that's a very long shot. When you, when you said at the beginning that in a bladder, you often find numerous uh, tumors scattered. But in one person, do all those tumors have the same? So, that, so do all the tumors within the same person have the same genetic makeup? And the answer is no. Um, we know from studies in cancer that there's continuing evolution that goes on within, within even one cancer as it grows and spreads. So that is another reason why it's so hard to cure people of bladder cancer if you can't just physically remove the tumor. Once the cancer spread, just trying to target any one individual change becomes very hard. And I can go back to if you think of a question and, you know. What were the clusters? So they try, what the researchers did here um, was they tried to create groups of of patients by making clusters. So they said this group kind of looks like, like for example, these uh, first three patients all had T P53, MLL2, and ARID1A mutations. And so they sort of, the computer can kind of group these patients together by what tumors look the most similar. This is not a very powerful cluster. You know, usually a cluster like it would be sort of all red up here and then all red down here and then all red down here. And that would clearly tell you there's three types of cancer. But this just tells you there's a. These were these were all super. Or sorry, all muscle invasive primary bladder cancers that were taken out at surgery. So they were all the same stage. This has not been done to this degree for metastatic cancer because it's, it's probably an even a, another level of difficulty. And these are all untreated. They've never had any kind of treatment. Um, so this is what it looks like when a urologist puts a camera into the bladder. Um, and what you see here is essentially the tumor, which sort of looks like this kind of fern or this frond, kind of sticking out into the wall of the bladder. Um, most people, as I said, will have blood in the urine. Some people will have irritation while voiding without the blood. Usually both happen together. Um, this is, again, a cystoscopy. Usually the urologist, when he puts the camera in, will also be able to scrape away or cut away a little piece of this and retrieve it and then send it to a pathologist who can look at the slide under a microscope. Um, the other way we diagnose bladder cancer, we've alluded to this before, is, is what's called cytology, which just means looking for cells in liquid. And so if you can look in the urine, you can spin the urine down and smear the cells out on a slide, and you can look for abnormal cells. Um, so this is probably the best slide for staging. And when we talk about staging, um, I already said, you know, this is the bladder. Here you can see the muscle in red out here. The yellow stuff is fat that surrounds the bladder, kind of hugs the organ. Uh, this is a man, so this is the prostate down here. 
And what this shows you is the very, the different types of staging for bladder cancer. So the, the most bladder cancers I said start, in fact, all bladder cancers start on the uh, very innermost layer of the bladder. And so when they occur at this level and they're really small, they can be called, we say T, which stands for tumor. They can be called TIS, which stands for in situ cancer or very early cancer. It's analogous to something called CIS for breast cancer. If they start to develop these sort of fronds, they can be called a TA tumor. These are very superficial and these can be just scraped off. If they start to um, grow down into the first layer of the bladder, they're called T1. But this is still all outside the muscle. Let me see if I can do this. This area is still all outside the muscle. So urologists can go in there essentially with the tool and scrape these cancers away. The challenge is really when it starts growing into the muscle here, and this is called the T2 tumor. And you can see the sort of different degrees of muscle invasion. This is just more. If the cancer pouch sort of grows all the way through the muscle and pouches out the other side, that's called the T3 tumor. And that goes into the fat. And then if it grows into the next organ, which is the prostate in men, or generally the uterus in, in women, but sometimes just the wall of the pelvis, um, that's called the T4 tumor. And those are obviously much worse because they require much bigger interventions. Does that make sense? Um, so this is the, what I just said. The reason I show this slide is these are all the different sort of levels of staging. Generally, T1 tumors and below are treated by a urologist, and rarely do medical oncologists get involved because urologist sort of has all the tools to manage those patients. If the tumor invades the muscle, it becomes a sort of multimodality treatment, meaning that a medical oncologist usually gets involved, a urologist, sometimes a radiation oncologist. And I'll say more about that in just a little bit. Um, this is how the urologist removes the tumor. So this is essentially a cystoscopy. And what you're seeing here is a sort of a low-grade tumor. It's a little hard to tell how deep it goes. But what the urologist does is he puts in a um, instrument that has electricity running through this wire that you can turn on and off. And he basically just puts this instrument into the furthermost edge of the tumor or distant edge of the tumor and then scrapes away. And what he scrapes away is essentially the lining of the bladder. And he'll keep scraping until he gets down to an area of muscle, which he can, I don't think you can see well here. And once he sees the muscle, he'll stop scraping because that's a sufficient, you know, he doesn't want to scrape all the way through the bladder. Okay. For these very superficial tumors, that's sometimes all that's needed. They can be scraped away, and then they can come back in three months or six months and look back in the bladder because the very superficial ones don't recur that quickly. Um, for patients who have anything more than just the most superficial um, types of bladder cancer, there have been hundreds of studies, thousands of patients looking at whether giving a treatment into the bladder itself, for example, chemotherapy, or something else could just get rid of the cancer or sort of eradicate the cancer. Um, and this is a picture of BCG, which is also goes by the name Basile Kamet Guran. I don't know, has anybody here received this as a vaccine or as a treatment for bladder cancer? Well, for both. For both, yeah. So this is used as the tuberculosis vaccine, and it's not really used in the US, uh, but it's used internationally still. And what it is, it's this green stuff, these little green bacteria that um, uh, essentially cause a very robust immune reaction. So if they're given into the arm, they cause a very robust immune reaction. And that immune reaction can then look at TB, tuberculosis, which is also a bacteria, and identify it and kill it in the same way we get a flu vaccine. Um, about 100 years ago, Basically, doctors at that time put these bacteria into the bladder of people with bladder cancer. Which sounds a little crazy, but what it did was it caused this tremendous in inflammatory reaction. So the body really doesn't like having bacteria in the bladder. And what happens is immune cells pour into the bladder and essentially uh, cause a lot of inflammation. And that inflammation is actually beneficial to a lot of patients because it stops the bladder cancer from coming back. Essentially, the immune cells get turned on, see the bladder tumor, and then sort of go after it. It sort of, you know, sort of invites the immune system into the bladder. Does that make sense? There are other types of treatment that can be given. I'm not really going to focus on these. These are all chemo types of chemotherapy. The idea is just try and kill the cancer cells by, by putting essentially a poison into the bladder. 
Interferon is a type of treatment that's been around for a long time as well that can be given into the bladder. That also causes the immune system to turn on and attack the cancer. Um, for muscle invasive disease, I've already said it's a little different because you know a, a surgeon can't just scrape away the entire lining of the bladder and render somebody cancer free. Um, so about 40% of patients who come in with early stage disease, who show up with just a T1 or a TA tumor, will eventually progress to having muscle invasive cancers. So those patients need to have uh, like a long surveillance or a long period of surveillance to make sure that the cancer doesn't come back. Um, if somebody comes in and has muscle invasive disease, if, for example, the bladder's been scraped and we see cancer cells in the muscle, we almost always get a CT scan to just really define where the cancer is. Sometimes a chest x-ray to make sure it's not traveled to the lungs. Sometimes a bone scan to make sure it hasn't gotten into the bloodstream and landed in the bones. The treatment then gets, gets tricky, or more complicated, I should say, because the bladder needs to either come out entirely or there are strategies that we can use to sort of preserve the bladder because most people don't want to lose their bladder. And we call that um, definitive treatment or, or bladder sparing treatment, but uh, essentially involves radiation. I'll explain more in just a second. Um, so in fact, I'll talk first about the radiation. So, <clears throat> you know, if the tumor invades into the muscle, we can, we can remove the bladder or we can give radiation. Radiation is essentially a way of uh, delivering a high dose of energy to these cancer cells, so much energy that the cancer cells die. And so a patient can essentially receive radiation and keep their bladder. So the benefit of that is obviously that it avoids surgery because most people don't want to undergo surgery if they don't have to. And there's some studies showing that people who keep their bladders have a better quality of life, which is a good thing. Um, very frequently, if somebody has a lot of comorbidities, meaning they're very sick, they have heart disease, bad diabetes, you know, prior surgeries, they may, we may want to avoid trying, you know, taking that person to the operating room. And so we might try and preserve their bladder by using radiation. The problem is that when you radiate the bladder, you're just causing more damage to the bladder. And yes, you may knock out the cancer, but um, you can also hurt a lot of the normal tissue. So the normal bladder can get very irritated and the bowel, which sits right behind it, can get very irritated. And uh, a mentor of mine basically summed it up by saying it's like having a sunburn on your rear end you know, and inside of the body. Um, there's still a chance that the cancer can recur because all you've done is damage the bladder more than it already was. You may have knocked out the cancer, but the, there's still a risk there. And obviously the patients still need um, surveillance to make sure that the cancer doesn't come back. Most of the people who have the cancer recur, it's just a superficial recurrence. Um, so the way we preserve the bladder most commonly is by giving this last option, which is radiation and chemotherapy together. Um, very rarely we'll just keep resecting these tumors if somebody's really not fit to undergo more treatment. So we know that if this is an example of somebody getting radiation. And so the machine obviously is, is this large machine. The beam comes out right through the middle. And what happens is the table moves and the machine moves. And so the essentially the radiation oncologist can plot out a way to give doses of radiation from every angle. And essentially where all these beams of radiation cross is where the highest dose of radiation is going to be given. And that way they can give a very high dose to sort of the bladder and spare a lot of the other tissues rather than just giving one gigantic dose from one direction, in which case all of the tissues in that path are going to get the same very high dose of radiation. Um, generally when we give radiation, we give chemotherapy, radiation together, most patients do pretty well, but like I said, some patients will have recurrence and then eventually need their surgery anyway. So this is always a very tricky um, decision, and we spend actually a fair amount of time counseling patients about whether to think about radiation or whether to think about surgery. Uh, questions before I move on, move on from this? Um, so now I'm going to talk about the surgery, which is called a cystectomy. Cysto means bladder, and ectomy means removing. So cystectomy is taking out the bladder. Um, the blood, when the bladder comes out, the, this is a schematic of here's a kidney, here's a kidney. The ureters here need to be removed or cut. And so the, 
in order to retain continence, in order to allow the patient to be able to pee, we have to do something to route the urine back out, out of the body. And so there are two ways of doing that. The first one is uh, putting in what's called a neobladder or a new bladder. And this is really wild, but basically a, a segment of the intestine is taken, sort of cut at both ends and fashioned into a new bladder while it's still receiving its blood supply. And the ureters are essentially plugged into that and the urethra is plugged into that and that becomes the body's new bladder. And I'll show you some slides that are just really wild about that. The other option is to not have a new bladder, and very frequently if somebody's very sick and can't undergo a big surgery like that, they'll end up with what's called a urostomy, which is a very small opening in the side of the belly with a bag around it. And the urine will essentially drip into that bag and then gets changed a few times a day, um, depending on how, uh, how active it is. Questions about this? Um, so again, this is just sort of the schema where the, you have kidneys, bladder, and the um, ureters here need to be cut, and the urethra here needs to be cut. This is in the man. And so what we're talking about is, is fixing, you know, creating a solution here so the urine can leave the body. Um, this is what a urostomy looks like. There's a very small piece of bowel that's taken, that's cut at both ends and closed, and the ureters are just routed into that. This, this distal end is just closed off. And here's a pouch. And then a little sort of adhesive goes over there. And urine drains into that pouch. Question? Uh, with the needle bladder, when you have that, what about the neurology? What about feeling? So it's, you, you get the sensation that you need to, to go. Yes, yeah, so that's a really good question. So the answer is not really. Because the bladder, our, our native bladder, our normal bladder, is very attuned to being stretched, and we know that when it's really stretched, it's time to go. When you replace that with a loop of intestine, it gets different. There's still a sensation of it being stretched, but because the nerves have been sort of caught and moved around, it's a very different sensation. The sphincter, which holds the bladder closed, holds the urethra closed, is also cut, and so patients have a lot of incontinence when they have a neobladder because they can't control it, and what they need to do is actually exercise the floor of the pelvis the same muscles you use to sort of hold your bowels, and that can help hold the bladder in. So that takes time. That usually takes six months before patients can have like reasonably normal, you know, four to six hours without needing to go to the to the bathroom. Um, so it's not um, it's not ideal. And I actually tell a lot of people that this is actually not you know people, nobody wants to have a stoma or an ostomy, but we have patients who have these and like play tennis and go skiing. And, you know, like they only have to change it once or twice a day. So it actually kind of opens up possibilities instead of closing them down. Um, so it's not as, personally, I don't think it's as bad as, as, as it gets billed. So this is how the neobladder is made. And so, again, this is that same picture before the bladder is removed. And this is a picture of the intestine, which is essentially cut here and cut on a, on a distal end and sort of almost like a baseball turned from a linear strip into a three-dimensional structure. And this is how it's done. This is the intestine where it's basically cut at both ends. It's almost opened up right, right along the midline, so it's like filleted open. And then it's all sewn together. This is while the patient's in the, obviously in the OR, but while the blood supply is still coming to this. And then essentially it's closed up. The ureters are both implanted into it, and the urethra, or the, the exit from the bladder is implanted into it. Usually a catheter is put in there to allow it to heal correctly. So the patients will have catheters in there for a few weeks after the surgery to allow everything to kind of heal appropriately. And then essentially it's closed up and it, it essentially functions as a, as a usable bladder. And so that's important for people who are very concerned about the cosmetic effect of having a, an ostomy who really don't want that. Um, and, you know, want to have some sort of feeling of... Um, uh, control over when the urine comes out. Questions? Why can't you just set up the bladder and allow the urine to flow directly through the, into the... Into the urethra? Yeah. Partly because then it would just be continuous dribbling through the urethra. And so you'd have to put something over in a man or a woman. You'd have to have either a condom in the man or in a woman. It's even more tricky. 
there's not a good way to just stop the dribbling. And as you know, as all of us know, like in a baby, they get diaper rash when when the skin touches urine for too long. So it becomes a big, big problem if you don't do something to preserve the continents. Um, so I'm going to go back a little bit more to think about how we think about bladder cancer in the big picture. And this is just a graph looking at everyone who got bladder cancer and how advanced the disease was at the time of surgery. And what, they, what these investigators saw, this was like a thousand patients, maybe a little less, that if the cancer was just confined to the bladder itself, the chance that they were going to recur was, uh, uh, sorry, of not recurring was very low meaning most of these patients were cured. So if the cancer is just confined to the bladder, there's only about a 15 or 20% chance for all comers that the cancer is gonna come back somewhere else in the body. If, <clears throat> if the cancer had spread out beyond the bladder when they took the bladder out, if they saw that it was pouching out the other end of the bladder, the risk of recurrence was more like 50%. And if they took the bladder out and they took out lymph nodes nearby the bladder and they saw cancer in those lymph nodes implying that the cancer had already gotten out of the bladder, the likelihood of being cured was much lower. It was only on the order of about 30%. And so obviously the patients in these second and third groups are in much more trouble than the patients up here who overall do, do better. Questions about this? So, um, Chemotherapy, we've known about for a long time in a lot of different cancers. And it's been looked at in a lot of different ways in bladder cancer. Traditionally, most patients would get their bladders removed. And if they were high risk, if they were in the lymph nodes or it was pouching out the other side of the bladder, they would get chemo. Um, the challenge is that um, all of the studies that we've done of adjuvant chemo, that's called adjuvant, meaning giving it after surgery, after you remove the bladder, almost all of those studies are flawed. They've all had trouble essentially getting patients onto the studies. They've had to stop early. Uh, and the reason is that most people who got registered in these studies went to surgery, had their bladders out, and then they'd just been through this sort of very big surgery, a very tough time. And then the investigator said, okay, now we're gonna give you chemotherapy. And most patients were just like, forget it. I don't want it, you know, it's too much. And so a lot of patients will stop treatment as soon as their bladder's out because it's sort of it's one of the biggest insults to the body and they, they feel like they can't handle it. Or the patients had complications from surgery and they didn't heal right and they, they ended up in the hospital for two months and they're just barely getting back on their feet and they don't feel like it's a good time to get chemo. <laughs> so all these studies that we've done have failed to show a really convincing benefit. There was just a study presented two weeks ago. This was just presented at our, at our ASCO meeting, which is the biggest oncology meeting in the world, that showed in blue that if you gave chemotherapy after surgery, you, patients did better because they were higher up on this curve in terms of living longer than if you waited. But this is still a bit of a matter of debate. And so for somebody who comes to see me who has high-risk disease, who's never had chemo, I usually try and recommend it because there's at least some data to say, yes, this is a good thing to do. But about 15, 10, 15 years ago, we sort of knew this. We've known this for about 20 or 30 years in bladder cancer. People said, well, why don't we give the chemotherapy first? Because if nobody wants chemo afterwards, maybe they'll be in better shape before surgery to get chemo. And if the chemo is going to work, we'll know at the time of surgery that the cancer has shrunk. And so there are all these reasons to give chemotherapy beforehand. The first is that the blood supply to the bladder is still intact, right? If you're giving chemo after the fact, the chemo may not even get into the area you want it to get to if the whole thing is scarred up. So you can deliver the chemo there. You don't have to wait, as I said, for people to feel better because they come in and they obviously want to get treated. You can downstage or shrink the tumors so you'll sort of know that the chemotherapy worked and you can maybe make surgery easier for the surgeon if it's a big tumor. Um, and you can look, you can give somebody two cycles of chemotherapy and then take a, take a scan after two cycles. And if they're not having a response to chemo, you go right to surgery. And if they're responding, you can keep giving it and sort of, you know, uh, benefit people who are, or give chemotherapy to people who are benefiting. And then you obviously find out what the chemo did. And that's sort of important prognostically. Um, so there've been a lot of different regimens. I'm actually gonna sort of go through this. The standard regimen, that we use is this combination of four drugs here called methotrexate, vinblastine, adriamycin, cisplatin. Uh, 
Um, this has been sort of modified recently. I don't think the names of these drugs are that important. Um, but they showed a benefit if you gave chemotherapy first, patients were more likely to be alive at any time point than if they never got the chemotherapy. So there's definitely a benefit to giving chemotherapy in bladder cancer. Actually, the same study where they did this, they tested chemotherapy before surgery, had this somewhat uh, finding that makes sense, but I don't think anybody really thought they would see it. And this is breaking out that same graph by looking at whether or not the patients had um, all the cancer disappear after they got chemo, or I should say all the cancer disappear when, they're, when they had their surgery. So they said if patients had all their cancer disappear, um, what they saw was that patients did really quite well, meaning they were in these arms up here. So if there was no cancer at the time of surgery, it sort of makes sense that patients are going to do well. So that's a, that, that question, why would you do surgery if there's no cancer, came up sort of as this data was being presented. And, you know, the challenge is that um, some of these people do recur. So clearly there's, even if the chemotherapy or whatever treatment you've given before surgery has made it, has made it difficult to see the cancer, the patients probably still have cancer cells in there and are still at risk. So it's, it's rare that we would ever not recommend somebody get surgery. If there was still cancer at the time of surgery, people did much worse, and that makes sense, because if you're just giving chemotherapy to somebody and their cancer has not shrunk, then that implies that it's somewhat of an aggressive or more resistant type of cancer. Um, and so whenever I give somebody chemotherapy before surgery, I'm always really, really thinking about what is, this, what is the pathology going to look like? And if it comes back with no cancer, it's like, you know, I want to open up a bottle of champagne with the patient because it's a really good sign that they're, um, they're you know, maybe cured of bladder cancer. Whereas when we see residual disease, it's not, it's not a slam dunk that the cancer is going to come back, but it puts people at higher risk that the cancer is going to come back. Question? Muscle invasive. This is people with muscle invasive bladder cancer who got chemotherapy before surgery. Why is chemotherapy not considered when it's a superficial? So that's a really good question as well. Why why don't we give chemo when it's superficial? It's been looked at, but it doesn't seem to be as effective in the very superficial tumors. And it may have to do with the fact that the chemo doesn't penetrate as well to the very innermost layer of the bladder as it does to the deeper tissue. It may also have to do with the fact that the superficial tumors are generally grow at a slower rate, so they don't take up as much chemo. But I don't think anyone's for sure answered that question to say exactly why the superficial tumors. Mostly it's been, chemotherapy has been used, has been given in the bladder, you know, to bathe those tumors in the chemo where you can get a much higher dose of chemotherapy right on top of the cancer cell. But um, I don't think there's a really great answer for why systemic chemotherapy doesn't affect those tumors as well as it does here. Uh, will radiation destroy the cancer? Yeah, so radiation was what I was talking about a little while before. Radiation can definitely stop the cancers from growing. Um, and in some cases cure people of the cancer, the challenge is that, you know, it damages the bladder itself, and so there's a lot of surveillance required afterwards to make sure new cancers don't come back. Is the bladder <clears throat> basically a simple organism so that if you, if you do all these things, it still works? Yeah, so the question is if you do all these interventions to the bladder, does it still work? If you radiate the bladder, it does scar and shrink. And so normally when our bladders fill up with urine or with liquid, it stretches. And we get a sense that it's, you know, as it starts stretching that it's time to go. Once the bladder's been radiated, it only stretched to a certain degree, and then it's scarred, so it stops. And if any more urine comes in, which is happening all the time, you know, the bladder just spasms. And so a lot of people will get spasms, cramps, They'll get incontinence where essentially they, you know, they just can't hold it anymore. So it's, a, it's another challenge, and it's something we counsel people about when they get radiation, that it, their bladders may not be the same bladder they had before treatment.
Um, so I'm going to skip through this. This just shows that neoadjuvant early chemotherapy is good. Chemotherapy today is actually still surprisingly underutilized, meaning that most people who have bladder cancer that's invading the muscle don't get chemotherapy first. And part of that may be because a lot of them are seeing urologists. Most patients are seen in the community. And urologists may just want to take patients straight to surgery. The patients may want to go straight to surgery. Um, and so there's still some, I think, some education to be done to get more people treated. Here at UCSF, everybody with muscle invasive disease gets evaluated, almost everybody gets evaluated for chemotherapy. And if they're a candidate, we usually, we usually recommend it. Um, We'll talk about the side effects of chemo in a little bit. Chemo is not necessarily um, as toxic as everyone thinks, but there are definitely side effects that include kidney damage and damage to the nerve, sometimes damage to the hearing, risk of infections. Those are the major ones, nausea, that um, we worry about. And so a lot of those, some of those are short-term side effects that get better, some are more long-lasting. We'll talk about that in just a little bit. Um, the most common regimen that we use are these two drugs, gemcitabine and cisplatin. I'll say a little bit more about those in just a little bit. I'm going to skip through this. Um, so I'm going to move on and talk about metastatic disease, more advanced disease. So this is a CT scan of a patient with bladder cancer. And essentially, the patient is lying flat on a table. His feet are sticking out into the audience, and his head is behind the screen. And he's looking up. And so this is his chest. This is a slice right about here. And what you're seeing is the air is black outside and the air in his lungs are black. So this is one lung and this is the other lung. And all this is the airways inside the middle of the chest and some of the blood vessels. And you can see there are these two very large tumors here that are sitting in the lung. And so this is where bladder cancer cells that started in the bladder got into the bloodstream. The, the veins basically brought it back up to the heart and from the heart it got sort of pumped out into the lung. And the lungs are like a net or a sieve for these cancer cells. And they basically get stuck in these very small vessels in the lungs and start growing there. And so there were clearly two, you know, two cancer cells that, or two clumps of cancer cells that landed in the lung and started growing. And this is obviously a major problem um, because it's taking up a significant portion of the lung here. Um, so chemotherapy, you know, chemotherapy has been around for a long time. Um, bladder cancer is, in general, very sensitive or reasonably sensitive to chemotherapy. So even though I think chemo gets somewhat of a bad rap, um, there is benefit to giving chemotherapy. The most common chemotherapy, and probably the most powerful chemotherapy we use, is a drug called platinum. And we think of platinum as sort of like a precious metal, you know, earrings are made of platinum, rings are made of platinum. But platinum is, I think of it more like a heavy metal. It's kind of like mercury and lead. They're all kind of in the same category. And those things are very toxic. And so this is sort of what platinum looks like as a molecule. It's a very simple little molecule. And what happens is when it goes into the body, these little chloride atoms uh, dissolve, and they just hooks right onto DNA in, in cells, it's sort of like a magnet almost. And once it hooks onto the DNA, it basically causes a lot of damage to the DNA. The DNA can't unwind, unfold, and it can't basically work right. Um, and so it's, it's very, uh, obviously very damaging. I talked a little bit about the side effects before. This can damage normal cells, so it can damage the kidney. It does the exact same thing to the cancer that it does to the kidney. Uh, it can damage the nerves in the ears, and it can damage the nerves in the fingertips. So basically anybody who gets this can get very sick. Uh, in, in, you know, treatment for metastatic disease has improved. So in the 1980s, the average survival was three months for advanced disease because we really had no good treatments. And this is 1980. This is, I think most people in this room would remember 1980. Um, it was a very dismal time to have bladder cancer. Um, now the survival's better. The survival's more in the order of a year, sometimes a year and a half for metastatic disease. But that's still pretty poor, you know, for somebody who comes in to, to have a year or year and a half prognosis. Um, and so there's a lot more we need to do here. Um, when I see somebody in the clinic who has bladder cancer, I, I really think about three things, actually two things that are very important. And the first is, do they have cancer in the organs, meaning in the liver, in the viscera, which means in the lungs, liver, 
you know, brain, anywhere else in the body, yes or no? And uh, what is their performance status? Meaning, are they bed bound? Are they able to go to the grocery? Are they able to walk up two flights of stairs? And you can sort of categorize people like that. And if people have a, a good performance status, meaning they can walk a city block without trouble, and say the disease is only in the lymph nodes in the body, or maybe it's just in the lung but nowhere else, those patients actually do pretty well. And this is survival. This is the number of people who are alive over time. And you can see there's some people with metastatic bladder cancer who can actually live a very long time. This is up to five, six years that people are living with bladder cancer. On the other hand, if they have disease in the liver or if they're very kind of ill from the cancer, survival is really poor. And most people don't live longer than two years who come in with sort of poor performance status and, and disease in the organs. And so um, this is very important for how we kind of think about the disease and how we counsel people in terms of treatment. Um, I'm going to skip through this. This is a regimen I mentioned before, MVAC. This was considered the standard for a very long time. It's very much become replaced. Um, I'm just going to skip through this. The problem with this regimen was that it's really, really toxic. So, you know, when you think about chemotherapy from the 70s, 80s, 90s, that, that just was, you know, people were getting admitted for because they were so sick. This was the regimen, or one of them. Um, and so people really had a lot of trouble getting this getting this treatment. They got a lot of infections. Sometimes people would die from the infection caused by the immune system being weakened from chemo. Um, there was a lot of irritation of the mucosa. People couldn't eat, couldn't swallow, they'd lose weight. So this is a, a really uncommonly used regimen, but it probably was the most powerful thing we had at the time. Um, this is a study, sorry, looking at a sort of a better version of this treatment with an immune boost, a treatment called Nupigen that helps people, um, helps their immune system. Um, gemcitabine has been around for about 15, 20 years now. Uh, gemcitabine is basically mimics DNA. So it looks like a base. This is, a, for example, a helix of DNA. And each one of these are individual molecules, each one of these colors. And so this is, so for example, cytosine could be this red base here. And you can see gemcitabine is almost identical to cytosine with the exception of, of one or two atoms here. And basically, it gets into the DNA. The body thinks it's normal sort of DNA substrate, and it just causes the cancer cells to become totally um, damaged, and they die. Um, and so this is very effective in bladder cancer. Um, the combination of platinum and gemcitabine has been tested in a lot of different studies, um, and basically is the same as this older, more toxic regimen. So most people who have bladder cancer today when it's metastatic, we'll end up getting this regimen. This is the same regimen we use early on when we're giving it to people before surgery. And this is pretty well tolerated. Like, people sometimes get tired from this, they can get nausea, but they go home, they can sort of have pretty normal lives while they're getting this. Usually by the end of a couple doses of this, it becomes, it becomes a little harder just because the cumulative kind of toxicity adds, adds up. So this is really the standard of care, this regimen when we talk about advanced disease. So I just have a few more slides. Um, and really what I want to say is, does adding more chemo have a benefit? You know, we have this backbone of gem and cis, gemcitabine, cisplatin. There's another drug called paclitaxel. It's used very commonly in lung cancer. It's used in um, breast cancer and a number of others. And then, so there was a study of, of PCG, mixing all three together. And what they saw was actually people lived longer they responded more, like almost two-thirds of the patient's tumor shrank. The problem was that there was a lot more toxicity. A lot of people were getting admitted to the hospital. So rarely we'll use a regimen like this if for some reason I think we really need to shrink a tumor down or if I think somebody is really like very fit and can kind of handle you know, three drugs all at the same time because that's tough for a 20-year-old where we do that routinely in testicular cancer, but it's very hard for somebody who's over the age of even 40. To, to get all three drugs at once. Um, so I want to talk in the last two or three slides just about targeted therapy. Um, and so when we say targeted therapy, you know, everything I've said about chemo, you know, chemo is effective, but chemo is essentially a poison to the body. And it doesn't discriminate between cancer cells and healthy cells. And that's why there's so many side effects to chemotherapy. It just gets taken up by all the cells in the body. Generally, cancers are growing faster than anything else in the body, so they take up more chemotherapy, they get more damaged. But it's not, you know, there's no chemotherapy that has no side effects. 
So the idea of using targeted therapy has really come about in the last maybe 15, 20 years. And the idea is let's find things that are unique about the cancer and go after that, properties of the cancer that are unique that we need to target. Um, for example, in breast cancer, there's a treatment called trastuzumab that goes after a very specific protein on breast cancer cells. And it's very effective in, in, um, in breast cancer because it's, you know, it doesn't really have the same side effects that chemo does. Um, and it targets the cancer cells. So this is a, just a diagram of a blood vessel growing down to what, what's supposed to be a cancer cell down here. So when cancer cells are small, it's very easy for them to get nutrients, right? The oxygen just floats around and gets into the cells. There's sugar, there's water, there's whatever other proteins they need. But as soon as the tumors start to grow and they become tumors of a million or 10 million or a billion cells all on top of each other, they need to get more resources. It becomes like a very stressful environment. And what these cancer cells will do is secrete factors that cause normal blood vessels to essentially grow right into the heart of the cancer. And so the cancers become essentially like self-sufficient by, by sort of co-opting the body's own blood supply to feed them, feed themselves. Um, so beginning about 10, 15 years ago, people said, well, what if we can interrupt not the cancer, but the blood supply to the cancer? What if we could stop the body from growing these blood vessels into the cancer? Would there be benefit? And lo and behold, there was, or there is, I should say, in lung cancer and uh, in colon cancer, and there's sort of debatable benefit in breast cancer. Um, so this has been looked at in um, bladder cancer with a drug called Avastin or Bevacizumab. And what it is, is a, it's an, what's called an antibody, which is basically just a molecule that goes all over the body, and here the molecule sort of sticks onto these factors that the cancer cell secretes to get these blood vessels made. So the cancer cell is essentially spitting out these factors, and the medicine just sort of sucks them up and stops those factors from being seen by the body. Does that make sense? So what happens is the, cancer, the blood vessels stop growing into the tumor, and the tumors shrink and die. In bladder cancer, it's been evaluated in an earlier study, and right now it's in a very large study, what's called a phase three study, where half the patients are getting chemo and the other half are getting chemo plus this drug. And we're gonna find out probably in the next year or two if this strategy actually works in bladder cancer. Questions? Um, this is, I don't expect you to, to, to be able to read all this, but this just talks about more chemo in bladder cancer. And I said the first chemotherapy we use, what happens if that stops working? It's, it's a difficult field because a lot of different drugs have some activity in bladder cancer. And these are all different studies that have been done in the last, you know, from 1997 to 2007. And what you can see is that this RR means response rate. And so after the cancer has stopped responding to traditional chemo or tr traditional platinum chemotherapy, the response rates are low. It's unlikely that, that patients' tumors are going to shrink if the initial chemo is not working anymore. And so this is a huge unmet need in, um, in the world of cancer. If you look in lung cancer, there's about seven or eight different types of chemotherapy that have benefit after the first chemo has stopped working. And the same is true in breast cancer and even in prostate cancer. But in bladder cancer, there's still no standard treatment after platinum stops working. Um, and a lot of this gets back to some of that heterogeneity I was talking about in the beginning. These cancers are so different, even within an individual person, that the, it's very hard to find one drug that is that powerful or that effective. Questions about that? So this is the very last, I think it's two or three slides for the talk. Um, this is probably the most exciting thing going on in bladder cancer today. And this is data that was just presented two weeks ago. And, you know, I've already said bladder cancer is so heterogeneous, how are we going to find that magic pill to cure it? Well, so maybe, maybe we're asking kind of the wrong question, right? Maybe we already, the answer is sort of already there in our body, and that's our immune system, right? We know that BCG, that bacteria, causes this very dense immune reaction or inflammation in the bladder, and that stops the early bladder cancers from coming back. So isn't there a way, or shouldn't there be a way to get our immune system all throughout our body to attack cancer cells wherever they are and essentially get rid of them in the same way? And so this is a picture of a tumor cell. This is like electron microscopy, so this is very, very high resolution. So purple is tumor, 
And yellow is a T cell or an immune cell. That's basically a policeman in the body goes around sort of, sort of knocking out other cells and checking their, essentially checking their papers. Um, and what happens here is, is really interesting. This is the interface of the T cell and the tumor. And so this is gonna be a schematic of the T cell and the tumor like I just showed you on the previous slide. And so normally the T cell goes around and literally interfaces with the tumor this way by sort of asking for the tumor to show a little piece of the, uh, the cell to show a little piece of itself. And what happens is the T cell checks that little piece and says, okay, you're part of my normal body, you're free to go. If the T cell sees that this, this little piece of, of protein presented by the tumor, if it sees that this thing is foreign, then it'll say you're infected, there's something wrong with you, and it'll just attack the cell and kill it. Right? Does that make sense, that, that idea? It's sort of like asking for the tumor's papers and then letting them go or, or, or arresting them. What the tumors do, or at least we think, is they get smart and they start, they start essentially putting on a disguise or doing something to get the T cells to go away. And what they do, this is the same picture, here's the tumor cell, here's the T cell, is they start expressing this protein that's called PDL1. And PD stands for programmed death. And the T cells actually express a little receptor for it as well. And what this, what this PDL1 protein does is it tells the T cell to go away. It says, don't eat me. And the reason it's called programmed death is because when the T cell uh, inter interfaces with this protein, it actually, the T cell is the one that dies. Because the T cell says, oh, this is something, this is a normal cell in the body. I should leave it alone. You know, this is a healthy cell. I shouldn't attack it. And so the tumors get smart and start expressing this. So PDL1 sort of expressed on a lot of our normal tissues. And the tumors get smart, start expressing that, and then the T cells see these tumors, and then they basically go away, or they die, or they just leave the tumor alone, and then the tumors are free to kind of cause havoc. Does that make sense? So this has been recognized maybe in the last five or 10 years, and basically a number of different companies have developed drugs that block this interaction from happening. And so um, there are three major ones that are in clinical trials now. Um, they're all antibodies, which is uh, sort of uh, proteins that are made naturally by our body. These are made in a lab and then given through an IV to the patients. Um, and this is what happens when you give this drug to somebody who has metastatic cancer. And so this is a patient who had a tumor in their lung. This is the exact same picture or orientation I showed you before. This is the tumor in their lung, and this is after about six months or a little more of this treatment by blocking PDL1. And what, what you can see is that this tumor has essentially gone away. So the immune system, this is the only treatment the patient had. So the immune system has essentially gone in there and chewed up this tumor and gotten rid of it. And so this is really exciting because we don't see this, we rarely see this in advanced bladder cancer. Um, this is what's called a spider plot. I think this is my last slide or second to last slide showing what happened to all the patients on the study. And so every line is one individual patient. And if the line goes up, that means their tumors grew. And if the line goes down, that means their tumors shrank. And in the black lines are patients who had their tumors not just shrink, but completely disappear. And so what you can see, and this is time on study is in, measured in days. So within, and these were all patients, I should say, who had already had chemotherapy for metastatic disease. So they were already in a very poor risk group. And giving them this immune therapy, you can see that about a third of the patients, their tumors really shrank, and they really shrank quick. Within six weeks, these tumors, which had been causing havoc all over their body, had, had either shrank or completely disappeared. And so this is like really, I mean, it's a small study, but it's a very impressive amount of data um, because it really suggests that maybe we are going about this wrong, and maybe what we really need to be doing is turning on our immune systems to attack bladder cancer you know, which we've known about for a hundred, over 100 years since BCG was first discovered in the, in the beginning part of the last century. So again, very exciting data. Um, so I think stopping smoking is probably the best strategy for stopping bladder cancer, preventing bladder cancer. So if anybody of you know smokers, you know, go home and tell them to stop. There's good data that if a doctor or a, a spouse tells somebody to stop smoking, they're more likely to do it. Um, 
you know, the genetic understanding, we're, we're still at a very early level. Like, yes, we know there's a lot of heterogeneity, but how do we go about targeting that? I'm not sure that that's very clear. The superficial bladder cancers, even though this was figured out 100 years ago, there's nothing's been shown to be better than BCG, so we still use it a lot. There's some studies looking at immune therapy, sort of newer immune therapies given into the bladder. We're going to have studies opening here looking at that. Uh, chemotherapy around surgery is good for bladder, is good for, you know, stopping bladder cancer, preventing it from recurring. Usually we'll give it beforehand, sometimes we'll give it after. Um, chemotherapy still has a role for metastatic disease. There's still a benefit there, but obviously these new therapies, especially the immune therapy and the um, blood vessel targeting therapy are on the horizon. And probably in the next two or three years, you'll see headlines coming out about the results of some of these studies. Well, thanks everyone for coming.